you're here for Writing Awesome Fellowships, and uh, I have to say I didn't come up with this title, Helen did, and I think it puts a little pressure on you to be awesome, and it puts some pressure on me to help you be awesome. But what I'm going to suggest this morning is that together we can be awesome if we approach the challenges of writing fellowships rhetorically. So what do I mean by that? It means I want you to think about your purpose very carefully. I want you to think about your audience very carefully, the genre that you're going to be writing, what is the form of the thing that you're going to be writing. And I also want you to prepare uh, to, to attend to your writing process to really take your application through many drafts and to get a lot of feedback on it. So that's how we're going to be awesome together. All right. um, to tell you a little bit about um, why I approach writing fellowship applications this way, I need to tell you about the Hume Center. Uh, so this is a brief commercial for the services that we offer. Uh, we did almost 11,000 appointments last year between writing and speaking. And we serve everyone from freshmen to professors. Okay, graduate students take almost 40% of our appointments. So uh, you're an important um, demographic for us. I want to highlight that we are the Hume Center for Writing and Speaking. So this means that we can support not only your writing projects that you're doing within your classes and outside of classes, but also any speaking endeavors uh, that you may be undertaking. Okay, so the first thing we do is we offer presentation coaching. You can uh, come in at any stage of the process. If you have to brainstorm a speech, by all means, come in and talk through um, your, your choices, your possibilities with an oral communication tutor. You can also practice your delivery with the oral communication tutor. We will film you and give you feedback right then and there uh, in our, in our um, tutoring rooms. Uh, Graduate students really love to come and, and prepare for job talks, for conference presentations. Um, you can even prepare for job interviews um, with an oral communication tutor. Okay, our writing consultations. Similarly, you can come in at any stage of the process from brainstorming to final revisions. And we help people uh, with all genres. Okay, so from abstracts for conference, pre com abstracts for, um, from conference presentations to dissertation chapters. Um, I recommend that you shop for tutors. We all know that that happens and we're totally fine with it. When you find someone you really enjoy working with, you can make recurring appointments with that person for up to five weeks. All right. We also offer digital media consulting. So if you're working on a video or on a web page and you just want to um, hone your message, you can come in and meet with our consultants to talk about that. A very popular program that we offer that is generously supported by VPGE uh, is our dissertation boot camp. Uh, we run 10 of these a year. The, this is an intense two-week period that you devote to writing um, with a group of peers, and people find this really helpful for developing their productivity skills. Okay, so that was, that's my quick commercial for the Hume Center. I hope you'll consider stopping by and seeing us uh, in your slides. There are um, links uh, to uh, the, the Hume Center website and more information about the kinds of appointments you can make, and that's at the end of the slides. But for now, I just want to explain a little bit about what we're going to be doing in the next 70 minutes or so. Uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about is figuring out how to address the priorities of the funders that you're applying to. Right? There's so much you could say to them. So how are you going to target? Um, how are you going to choose what you say to the, the fellowship that you're applying for? Um, then I'm going to um, have you think about reading rhetorically. And by that I mean I want you to look at what makes a piece of writing persuasive and think about what strategies you can adapt from that piece of writing for your own work. And then lastly, we're going to do an activity where you turn to each other and you kind of put into practice what we've just reviewed. You're going to give an, uh, an elevator pitch to your neighbor. Um, the spoken abstract of your research. Okay, so let's um, start with the premise of this workshop. You all have fantastic ideas. You're really creative people, right? But it's not enough to have a great idea, right, to win a fellowship. Um, you have to make a persuasive argument, right? Um, and that's because there's so many out there, right? So you have to, to argue that your project is the one that's worth funding. Right, and that it fits the mission of the funding body. Okay, 
So just a framework for how to consider approaching your fellowship applications. The first thing you want to consider is the funding mission, right, of the body that you're applying to. Um, there's a lot of different fellowships out there. There are um, external and internal fellowships, right? Some are specifically for Stanford students, some are national, right? Some um, will fund dissertations that attend to issues in diversity, right? Some will fund developing global leaders, and we're gonna look at um, prompts um, like these in, the, in just a moment. Um, but your, your fellowship application needs to argue that your particular project, right, or you, the person, will meet the goals of that fellowship. Okay, in general, you're writing to a non-specialist audience. Right? So what do I mean by this? It means that a lot of your readers will not be specialists in your specific subdiscipline. Okay, so you may occupy a special corner of civil engineering, right? but the people that you're writing to may be mechanical engineers, or they may be electrical engineers. So you're going to have to minimize your use of specialist jargon. And then the last um, piece of your fellowship application that's important is that you write with confidence and purpose. They want to know that you've really thought through right, your project, um, that you can get it done, and that you're worth funding. Okay, so this, both of these ideas are just kind of the, the, the framework for this workshop. Okay, so the first strategy we're going to talk about um, is the strategy of developing focus questions. Um, so what do I mean by focus questions, and, and why do we need them? As I mentioned, there's many types of fellowships, internal, external, right? Some are devoted to developing you, the person. Some are devoted to funding your project. Um, and very often, the prompts don't contain questions, right? You have to infer the questions. Um, even if they give you questions, right, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I, I need, you know, 20 pages to um, answer these questions, right? And I, I only have two. Okay, so focus questions are a way to help you prioritize the information that you share um, in your fellowship application. Okay, so what they do is they help you define your writing objectives, all right, your purpose for writing. They help you um, determine the direction of your writing, how you're going to approach it. Okay, and perhaps most importantly, they, are, they serve as a reminder during your writing process. So they'll help you get started because you'll think to yourself, well, these are the questions I need to answer, right? And then as you're um, doing the writing, you can check and make sure, am I answering them, right? And then after you're done writing, you can say, have I really answered these questions? Okay, so they're a kind of heuristic to get you started on your writing. We think of focus questions as belonging to three basic areas. Okay, the first um, type of focus question addresses the significance of your project. Okay, why does it matter? The second addresses your objectives. What are you going to do? Okay, and the third addresses your qualifications. Right, who are you? So some, some basic focus questions. I gave you some examples just then, but we'll hear a few more. Um, why should your project be chosen over other worthy research projects? How does your research match the mission of a particular fellowship or grant award? And how are you prepared to successfully complete the project, right, or your doctoral dissertation? Okay. But just to, to fine tune this a little bit further, we can divide fellowship, um, fellowships into two basic categories. The first kind funds doctoral studies, right? And the second funds doctoral research. Okay, so fellowships that fund doctoral studies are very interested in developing the person, right? They follow one individual. And that might be across numerous projects. And it may not be bounded necessarily by time or funds. Okay, by contrast, fellowships that fund doctoral research are very project specific. Right? And so they may have discrete time limits, 
right? Um, and they may, and, and that the budget also may be very um, discreet. Okay, so one follows the person, the other follows um, or funds the project. Okay, so what kind of focus questions are you gonna use to approach these, these two different types of fellowships? Okay, for doctoral studies, you, you're always gonna need to argue your, your project significance. But for doctoral studies, you're gonna put more emphasis on arguing your qualifications. Okay, so who are you as an intellectual? Right, who are you as a scholar? Okay, and in doctoral research, you're probably gonna put more focus into the objectives right, of the specific project. And that isn't to say that some of your qualifications won't come out right, as you're discussing the project, but it will be um, less, less a matter of the focus right, of your writing. Okay, so a couple more ideas for um, focus questions that will help you um, respond in these specific areas. Um, to address your qualifications, we talked about this, are you ready to conduct the research? Um, but I think they also are often interested in your intellectual development, right? How did you get to where you are today? How did you get to Stanford, why, right? And where do you wanna go? Okay, so often you need to articulate that in doctoral studies, fellowship applications. Okay, the objectives of your study, right? If you're applying more for the project-specific fellowships, um, you will probably address more of your methods, right? How will you conduct your research? They wanna know that your research is feasible in addition to being important. Okay, and lastly, the significance of your studies or project, right? Why is there a need for your research? Okay, so those are, those are some focus questions. Um, and now I'm gonna have us look at some prompts and develop questions in response to them, just to show you why this strategy can be helpful. So if you look at your slides, um, if you don't wanna read it on the screen, I have, um, I have the prompt up there. This is from the Switzer Fellowship Program. Um, there are actually some Stanford graduate students who have this fellowship. Um, one of them is a tutor for us in the Hume Center. She's a law student. I just saw her name on the website last night. Uh, so read this prompt. What are some questions that you would develop from this prompt that would help you um, apply for this fellowship? Okay, anybody have a couple ideas? We see that there's one question, right? But what else would you, do you feel like you need to answer? What career do you plan to have? What career do you plan to have, right? Who are you gonna be, yeah. Other questions, yeah. Why are you doing what you're doing? And why are you doing what you're doing? Notice how they're very person focused, right? Not project focused. Okay, much more about the qualifications. Yeah. yeah I had um, drafted, how are you preparing to become a leader in environmental science and policy, right? They, they wanna know that you're working on your leadership skills. And how are you doing that? Um, okay, so qualifications. Other ideas for questions that might need to be answered. And also, I think this somewhat what, what the implications are of your research, right, outside of academia. So um, I would be inclined to write a little bit about the policy ramifications, right, or the science ramifications um, in, this, in response to this prompt. 
Okay, great, so qualifications and significance. Okay, they're investing in the person. Okay, how about this prompt? This is a research fellowship from the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society here at Stanford. What are some focus questions you would use? <laughs> How can I show that I'm ready to start this project right away? Great. Yeah. Any others? For such a big group, you guys are kind of quiet. <laughs> okay, how will your research advance our understanding of philanthropy, right, or civil society? So being really specific to what they're calling for. And I know this might sound kind of obvious, but I've looked at stacks of fellowship applications in the VPG office, and people will apply, for example, to a fellowship on diversity in dissertations, and their application won't contain the word diversity. And so it, it, they haven't argued, right, that their application is a good fit for that, for that particular fellowship. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, you can't really always have a one-size-fits-all application, right, that's the point of this. All right, but this one, objectives and significance, right, it's much more project-specific. Okay, so you would have to name the objectives of your research. Okay, how about this one? This is really kind of a different kind of fellowship. <clears throat> yeah. I have a question about a focus question. Okay. Are these more, I don't know, high level explicit questions about the content mm -hmm. of your application? Or are these kind of implicit questions like you have to show that you're smart, you have to show that you have <laughs> I, I think all of those things have to happen in that, <clears throat> in your language and in your preparation and your attend, attendance to, uh, attention to conventions, to use your word. That's one way of showing your qualifications, right? Um, I think all of those things are happening. Um, but then it's, it's, I guess as you were saying, that's the high level, that's implicit. And what we're um, trying to articulate right now are some of the more explicit needs of the fellowship prompt, right? Which is, for example, in the previous one, how will your research contribute to our understanding of civil society, right? If you haven't answered that question, then they're not sure how you're gonna to contribute to their research group. Okay, so it's, it is about the style and it is about your preparation, but I think it's also about the content. Yeah. Okay, so how about this fellowship prompt? Right. Great. Yeah. Um, I put this one up because I thought it would get a laugh out of people because basically you do need to answer the question like how are you disruptive, right? <laughs> um, and that's what they're interested in. Um, and so, yeah, you will have to show something that you, that you plan on, um, you know, challenging. Yeah. Uh, so this one uh, is also about qualifications, right? How have you overcome your adversity? Um, how have you produced change? Right, um, and, then, and then how are you uh, disruptive? So again, it's much more interested in the person, right, in developing a leader, right, um, and less in the project. Okay, so these are um, very diverse uh, fellowship prompts, um, but I wanted to show you the, the full array of fellowships that are available to graduate students. Um, so the, the strategy of focus questions, you really have to make sure you use them once you develop them. So, Put them up around um, your computer as you're writing, right, to, to remind you of what it is, what your purpose is, right? Some people write them out on all caps at the top of their document, right? So it's really a way to help you um, stay focused as you're writing and revising. Yeah. Um, in, the last, in the last prompt, mm -hmm. it says uh, second year PhD students. Mm -hmm.
I mean, I think that's so fellowship specific, um, but you can write them and ask them. Is that what your question is? So, so like, no matter what point I am in my PhD, mm -hmm. there's always a fellowship that's available to me? Um, I'm going to answer that. That's a fantastic question. Yeah. So we've talked about a strategy for helping you identify the priorities of the funders, uh, and now we're going to talk a little bit about what you're going to need to write. In those previous calls, we just saw a call for an essay, right? Um, and that's a pretty <laughs> vague genre. Um, very often, you'll get a more uh, explicit description of what you need to write. Um, this is the description for the SIGF, what you need to apply or what you need to, to, um, to use to apply with. Uh, this is the diversity dissertation research opportunity that I mentioned earlier, uh, what they require. Um, my takeaway here is that very often a, um, a fellowship will require that you write a research statement. So this is the moment in the, the workshop where we're going to read rhetorically and think about what makes research statements persuasive. Um, I think you're familiar, right, with the idea of introductions, um, argument sections, and conclusions. Um, what I want to point out is what the specific moves are in each of the sections of the research statement. Um, the idea of, of rhetorical moves is an idea from Feek and Swales, who are research, discourse researchers at the University of Michigan. And they've analyzed a lot of um, research statements, and this is what they've observed. Um, the first thing is when you're applying for a fellowship, you need a little bit more of a hook. It's, it's more of a pitch, right, because you want to get your readers excited about your research um, and make it stand out, right, from what everyone else is doing. Um, of course, you're going to have to give them some context, right, so that they understand the problem that you're addressing. And then you're going to have to make explicit your motive, right, for your research. Okay, what's the research problem that you're addressing? The argument piece itself will give a description of your research, right? the project, your methods, and then you'll end with some significance or implications. Um, what I found in reading these is that very often um, the significance is alluded to in the opening, and we're going to talk about that uh, in just a moment. Okay, so basic structure of the research, research statement. This is an abstract that one, um, one of the BioX fellowships here at Stanford. So I thought we would just analyze this together. Where do you see the moves that I just described happening in this abstract?
Right. Worthy. Yeah. Great. Uh, and furthermore, they, they also apply, they have faculty teams that mm-hmm. are uh, very diverse. Mm-hmm. That, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, other moves that you found persuasive in this um, abstract. Yeah. Like uh, they write the engaging cards, video games, mm-hmm. but with a twist. It's not very awesome. Yeah. The, the language is, is pretty lively, right? Um, and certainly very accessible, um, which surprised me, yeah. Okay, right, so just in terms of the moves, um, you can see that there really is a hook, right? What is the problem, right? And they name it really um, explicitly. Um, and it gives some context for the particular problem. It describes the, the project description, right? And gives a rationale for it. Um, a member of the audience said that the faculty team really highlights the qualifications, right? And I agree. And notice, too, that it's interdisciplinary and that this is an interdisciplinary program. If you all are applying to any of those kinds of fellowships, you want to emphasize you know, how your research is inter- interdisciplinary. That's uh, part of what you'll need to address explicitly. Um, and then lastly, it makes the significance explicit. So this is just one example. Um, one thing you can do is <clears throat> ask in your departments for more examples, right, to see how people in your discipline have won fellowships. I think that can be really helpful, um, is to look at very discipline-specific uh, examples. OK, so the research statements that are required, sometimes they ask for an abstract, sometimes they ask for uh, a couple paragraphs, sometimes they ask for a full two pages. But regardless of how much space they allow you, you're still going to use that same basic structure. It's like an accordion, okay? You pull it out, right? And so you can think about um, how much space you may have to introduce your research, how much time you may allow to your method. If you have two pages, you can probably give many more details about your method. Right, and if you have two pages, you also can probably elaborate on your objectives much more fully. Okay, but the b- same basic structure that I outlined on that first slide, or that slide a couple ago with the, the box, right, it applies. Okay, there is a special consideration for the two-page um, research statement, and that's the most common one that I've seen, so I want to spend a little time uh, talking about the two-page research statement. Um, because they can be tricky to write. On the one hand, you have more space, and on the other hand, um, you really have to be careful about what choices you're making in terms of the content you include. So what I've heard from faculty readers is that the first two paragraphs are crucial. If, if you haven't really gotten their attention in those first two paragraphs, very often they won't read the rest of them. Okay, so those need to be really finely tuned. Um, and I put a quote up here from Cynthia Verb who uh, for a couple of decades was the research statement guru at Harvard. (laughs) And she has put her book called Scholarly Pursuits online. You can download the PDFs. There's a lot of uh, very helpful chapters that she wrote um, after decades of experience advising graduate students at Harvard about how to succeed in academia. And one of her chapters is specifically about the research statement, and that's where I took this quote from. Okay, so for her, Also, the first two paragraphs of your research statement are really crucial for the reasons that you can read for yourself. Um, For her, they really create um, a roadmap for um, the rest of the statement. Okay, so um, I pulled two examples of research statements that won um, a Stanford Interdisciplinary Graduate Fellowship, and I know many of you may be applying for that, and it's very competitive. Um, So we're going to take a moment to look at those together. Uh, So if you could, that was one of the handouts you should have gotten when you walked in. Uh, 
Okay, both of these students won uh, SIGF fellowships. So if you could take a moment to read these, and again, just to take note of what, what makes them persuasive. Um, these are the first two paragraphs of two-page research statements. Okay, so I'm open for uh, your responses to these paragraphs. What, what, made the, what makes them persuasive? They seem to know what they're talking about. Okay, so how, how does that come across? <laughs> they have like a logical flow of thought mm -hmm. that as someone who's not in either of these fields is convincing. Okay, great. So let's talk a little bit more about the logic. What, how, how do they lay it out? What is the flow? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. I, 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 the reason I chose this example is because I think it, it raises that interesting question. But let me just reiterate um, what you just said, because I think it is really important, is that in that first paragraph, right, he made it very clear how his approach emerges out of the prior scholarship, right, and how it's distinctive from the prior scholarship, right? And even in the, um, the decoding protein conformational dynamics, right, um, he's very explicit about um, addressing an open question, right, the scholars haven't yet, um, right, found the answer to. Okay, but why, why do you think in the first one he put the narrative hook as the second paragraph rather than as the first paragraph? It was a choice, right? He could have reversed it, I think. Yeah. It gave, it gave the hook some context. It gave the hook some context, great, within the scholarship. Yeah, and specifically addressed to an audience that's looking for interdisciplinary relevance, right? So he was applying for the Stanford Interdisciplinary Graduate Fellowship, right? And what he makes really explicit in that first paragraph is we can't just approach this question of Alexander the Great's, you know, success, right, from history. We also have to approach it using paradigms from social, social psychology. Okay, so from the beginning, right, he's arguing the fit of his project to the fellowship. And I think if he had just opened with the story, they might not have been sure of that, right? Did it feel odd to you, though, to, to move from what is like pretty traditional, formal academies to more of a storytelling hook in the second paragraph? It did feel odd to you, yeah, yeah. Natural, okay. Right. 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 Okay, great. Yeah. And there's kind of two ways of asking it. I like how he um, ends with this informal question, right, which is a way of putting in, in layman's terms, non-specialist terms, right, because he's a classicist and the people who are reading fellowships for the Stanford Interdisciplinary Graduate Fellowship are from all fields all across the university, right? And so in a way, by asking that question, how did he do this, he was speaking to those readers who are outside of classics and who are outside of psychology. Okay, so again, he's also aware of his non-specialist audience, just to go back to the slide from earlier in the presentation. Okay, other things that made these paragraphs, these four paragraphs persuasive. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. Revision is, is, is extremely important. Your, your prose needs to be very polished. Um, again, when I looked at the, the stack in VPGE and looked at people's notes, right, as they were evaluating fellowship apps, they would say, well-written, well-written, you know, so they had been revised many times, 
Um, and if you didn't get the well-written comment, right, you were less likely to get the fellowship. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Okay, great. Right, okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think in both, right, the contribution and the significance is articulated explicitly in um, the, the first couple paragraphs, right? Um, so we know in um, the Alexander the Great example that um, he's, he's basically kind of re revising the history, right? That expertise isn't just a modern phenomenon, it's also a classical phenomenon. And he makes that contribution clear at the end of the first paragraph. Um, in the decoding protein conformational dynamics, it's really clear at the end of the first paragraph what the significance is, right? Because he makes it explicit. In addition to deepening our appreciation of how life works at the molecular level, it will also assist efforts to engineer proteins to carry out new functions for medicine and biotechnology. So he's emphasizing some practical applications as well, right? And I'll, I'll just read you a little bit about what the prompt is for Stanford Interdisciplinary Graduate Fellowships. They fund students who have demonstrated evidence of the potential for innovative research in an interdisciplinary area, right? And so I think both of these emphasize that, right? The second one, it's, it's really at the intersection of biology and engineering, right? Um, the ability to link intellectual innovation with solving societal problems, right? So these practical applications, I think both of them um, argue that, especially the second one. Um, An interest in communicating to a broader audience Right? And a capacity for future leadership will also be considered as positive factors. Um, and so that, that piece, an interest in communicating to a broader audience, that was, that's part of the fellowship call. And I think it was an interesting choice, right, on, from the classicist perspective, right, when he includes the story of Alexander the Great, as it, it kind of showed the readers, right, I have the strategy for reaching broader, audience, broader audiences, and that's storytelling. Okay, so that may have been one reason he chose to include that narrative there um, as his second paragraph. Okay, any other thoughts about these opening paragraphs? Um, other things you admired about them that you just want to share with the group? Yeah, sure. So I noticed the protein one talks a little bit more about the sort of state of protein. Yes. Yes. In a way that um, the fourth century Greece one does not. Like it doesn't say, this is what Douglas North says, and specifically, this is what is missing in the North, or this is what is missing in the sources about this now. Right. What is that? And that's something that I would expect is in the dissertation, but didn't make it into this. Right. I think it's. No, I don't think it's too specific. It's just how much can you say, right? Um, and how do you frame it? Um, so I I agree that um, the 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 biology example um, gives you a much better sense for where the field's at in this particular question about method, right? Um, and I think it's because his whole dissertation ended up being about method and and developing new methods of research. Um, I think the classics uh, example, if I'm remembering correctly, he goes on and toward the end of the research statement, talks a little bit more about the contribution to the field. Um, but for this opening hook, he was just kind of using a luminary um, in order to uh, position his response. And, and I think you can get away with that in, in a field like classics a little bit more than you could in, in engineering. Um, but I, I, I would recommend are always articulating the, the research problem, right? So what, and to do that, you have to describe the state of the field, right, and some limitation in the field. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, it, <laughs> it varies. I mean, I think it's a, it's a choice, and it can be very discipline specific. I think if they're fun, yeah, if, yeah, if they're funding the person, 
I think it's you're going to have to describe, or you're going to have to use the first person, right? And if they're funding the project, right, the, the agent may be much more this project, right, this research. So you could think about it again in terms of um, responding appropriately to um, the, the nature of the fellowship and the call of the fellowship. Okay, any other questions from the examples? Okay, thank you. All right, so we've talked about a strategy for assessing what the funders want, right, which is the use of focus questions. We've talked about how to structure your response to those focus questions, which is the research statement. Now I'm going to have you put into practice what we just reviewed. All right, so this is an exercise where you're going to turn to your neighbor and you're going to imagine that your neighbor is a funder, all right, your dream fellowship, <laughs> okay? And I want you to give them, your neighbor, a quick elevator pitch of your research, okay? So you practice doing what we just talked about, okay, to a non-specialist audience, someone who doesn't know your research. And I want you to think about just the three categories, right, that you're going to need to address. How are you going to get their attention? What's your hook going to be? How much context are you going to give them? Right? How will you describe your research, your project? And then how will you explain its significance? Okay, so we have time, all right? And you don't learn anything unless you practice it right away. So that's why I'm making you do this. And this is a workshop, right? So you need to do a little work. Um, so I want you to turn to your neighbor, take three minutes to give a pitch, right? Get some feedback from them. And then they will turn to you and give you their pitch, all right? And you'll give them some feedback. And so this will take about 10 minutes, all right? OK, so um, this was great. A lot of lively interactions between funders and uh, students making their pitches. Were you persuaded? Did you, would you fund your neighbor? And why? <laughs> yeah, nods? OK, great. <laughs> all right, so there's a couple points to this exercise. Um, the first is that it's useful to practice what you've just heard, which, as I said, was the first reason I asked you to do it. Okay? But the second reason is that often when we talk through our projects, we develop much more concise and less specialist language to describe our projects. So if you're having trouble starting writing your fellowship applications, it can be really helpful to pitch your project or you know, your intellectual history, right, to um, a very well-educated but non-specialist caring audience, right? And so I figured that that's who you would find, you know, among your peers, right, is people who understand the situation that you're in, very well-educated, right, but who don't know your specific field. Okay, and the idea is, is that every time you talk it out, you'll discover new language, right, new ways to represent your project and who you are. And that can be really, really powerful. Um, the next thing I would recommend you do that when you do that is that you get some feedback, like what worked, right? What was persuasive, what wasn't persuasive, right? And then you revise your pitch based on the feedback that you got from your listener, from your audience. Okay, so it's always that, um, that, that circle, right, of writing, revision, writing, feedback, and revision um, that you need to to pursue in, in crafting a great fellowship application. Um, I'm going to move to the last few slides in just a moment, but um, I think some of you were already filling this out um, while you were doing sharing uh, your, your pitch with your neighbor. But this is a little bit more elaborate worksheet for that, um, the elevator pitch worksheet right here. It gives you a few more um, prompts to help you um, structure your pitch. And uh, it's one of our more popular worksheets. It kind of breaks down um, an abstract into five questions. And if you can just answer those questions in one to two sentences, um, you will have basically a very nice abstract for your fellowship application. OK? All right. So that's, that's one of our takeaways for the workshop. 
All right, so just some reminders. Um, this was already brought up when we were discussing what made the sample paragraphs persuasive, is they sounded like they knew like they, what they were talking about, right? The style was, was graceful, and um, there was a lot of forward momentum to those paragraphs, uh, and, and the, the language was very precise, right? And they were correct. All the, the sentences and the, the spelling and, and so on were correct. So um, that takes a lot of time to achieve, right? So create a writing schedule where you plan backwards from when the fellowship applications are due, and make sure you build in plenty of time for feedback and revision. And, and be um, honest with yourself in terms of the conflicts that you may, might have. You know, you might have conference presentations, you might have a wedding you have to go to, right? Put all of those into the calendar so you're really frank with yourself about what you can get done when. Um, as far as feedback goes, I recommend feedback from two types of readers. I recommend feedback from specialist readers, right, who can comment on the content and the, some of the questions that you've been giving me, like how much of the field should we try to represent, should we use the first person, right? That can sometimes be discipline specific. Okay, so it's helpful to get a reader who's within the discipline. But I think it's also really helpful to have a non-specialist reader because that person can tell you, because this is a pitch, right, to generally non-specialist readers, that person can tell you how persuasive is it in terms of its logic and its style, right? How clear is it? Okay, so take some time to get feedback from both those types of readers. Um, I just want to alert you, there's another version of this workshop on Thursday, October 23rd that's two hours long if um, you want a little bit more support. Um, our next dissertation boot camp starts on November 3rd, uh, so if you're interested in getting some serious writing done, uh, come in and register for that uh, on October 20th. We also have a workshop on slide design in November. Uh, and. I should have put that up on this slide. I'm sorry that I didn't. But if you go to our web page, uh, you'll see that workshop. And so if you, if you give a lot of presentations with uh, slides, we have a great lecturer uh, who um, will give you some, some visual principles um, with which to design your slides. All right, I just want to review quickly appointments, um, the, um, how that they work at the Hume Center, because some of the people who may be helpful to you as you work on your fellowship applications are uh, the writing tutors at the Hume Center. We have graduate students, and we also have lecturers who have PhDs who've been through this process themselves that you can make appointments with. You can look their bios up on our web page. Um, a lot of us really enjoy working on research statements for, research statements for fellowship applications. If you do come in for one of these um, writing appointments, I recommend that you make back-to-back 30-minute -back appointments, 60 full minutes, because that way we can really get all the way through a two-page research statement. All right, and you just go to hume.stanford.edu for um, availability. And that's all I got. Any questions or concerns? Yeah. Sure, it's building 250. It's on the quad. Um, so it's right across from Green Library and uh, Coverly, the School of Education. Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Um, any other questions like that? No, thank you so much for showing up on a Wednesday morning. And I wish you all the best of luck and, and that money just flows your way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>